Thanks very much, James, and um, thanks, thanks for having me here today. Um, I was just made aware that I'm between you and going to the beach, I understand, um, which is, is not really an envious position. Um, but I'm hoping this will be as interactive as possible. Uh, and, and what I want to share with you today is just some perspectives of what's happening in, in Southeast Asia and ASEAN. Um, and for many of you, you may say, well, you know, how, how directly relevant is that for our business? Uh, for some of you, as for the case of James's company, obviously there's very direct linkages. Um, but what I argue today is actually that I think Southeast Asia is going to be a big part of the Australian growth story going forward. If you think about the Australian economy over the last 15 years, we had a kind of a golden run. And a lot of that run was driven by China's transformation. Um, and, and we did it in the kind of an easy way, right, because we had the resources that China needed to grow. Um, sustaining Australia's growth is going to be a different model. And I think Southeast Asia is going to be increasingly important for that model. And so hence, I think it's important for us to understand exactly what's going on, because uh, this place is changing quite significantly, uh, and there's a lot of myths about actually what's going on and, and what's not going on in this region. So with that, um, I'm actually going to start with a question. We're going to do this old school kind of show of hands style. Um, and there's this one. What is the only man-made structure visible from space? We've got three options there, the Great Pyramids, Machu Picchu, and Great Wall of China. So we'll just do a show of hands. Great Pyramids. No takers from Machu Picchu. No takers, Great Wall of China. Oh, look at that, the crowd has spoken. Now, you know, I'm an, I'm an economist and we put a great wisdom, uh, great faith in the wisdom of crowds. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the crowds are wrong. Um, and in case, uh, unfortunately, this is one of those cases. Now, the, the first time that we could actually uh, described that the Great Wall of China being seen from the moon was actually in the 1500s, so well before we even had the remotest technology to even think about getting up to the space. Um, and here's the things you can see from space. You can see roads in the desert, you can see bridges, you can kind of see the pyramids, you can see mountains, cities at night, but as for the Great Wall of China, as China's first astronaut, Yang Li Wei said, uh, the scenery is very beautiful, but I didn't see the Great Wall. And they may say, well, you know, why is he talking about this? Well, the reason I mentioned this, I think it's actually quite instructive for how we think about Southeast Asia. Because I think there's a number of myths when it comes to Southeast Asia. Um, a lot of people, when they, they think of this region, they have certain images of the Asia financial crisis, uh, where a lot of people lost their skins with the, uh, the huge shocks to the monetary system. Uh, they have memories of kind of political upheavals, etc. cetera. Um, and often these are kind of misguided from where ASEAN is today. Um, and just to give you a sense um, of what ASEAN is, um, first of all, just a, a definitional sense. Um, so some of you may know this, but ASEAN is basically the name for the, uh, the 10 member states in Southeast Asia. So that includes, on the one hand, Singapore. Um, it also includes Indonesia, Philippines. Uh, includes also really um, emerging countries like Myanmar, Cambodia, and, and Laos. So a huge spectrum. But when you put these 10 economies together, they actually really are an economic powerhouse. And just have a look at some of the numbers here. ASEAN combined is the seventh largest economy today. It's growing at a rate that's just behind India and China. Uh, it's, its volatility in growth is actually really low. And this is one of the myths, right? That people often think of this as a high growth but high risk region. Well, yes, of course, there are political risks and we know what's happening in Thailand. There's always challenges in operating in certain parts of Indonesia. But in terms of economic growth, this has been a remarkably stable region. Um, also things like public debt and inflation are also at really attractive levels. So it's a region that actually has been flying under the radar, so to speak, for many different investors. Um, you may be saying, well, why have I grouped these 10 economies together? Have I just done like a fancy acronym like the BRICS and the MINTS that you may have heard in the press? Well, this is actually very different than those. Uh, this is not just a random collection of countries. There's some real economic and political underpinnings which are trying to create a formidable economic union. And I'll speak a little bit about what that means. The other aspect that's important to understand is what's happened to growth. And I'm going to delve a little bit, hopefully painlessly, into the world of economics here. But when you think about economic growth, what drives an economy, right? There's two things. You either add more people to the workforce or you make them more productive. And the same thing you do with all your businesses. And when you look at what's driven the growth of the major economies here in Southeast Asia, a large share of that has been the labour force. So even here in Singapore, the majority of growth has actually come from the increasing labour force rather than boosting productivity. Now, this gives us a bit of a what if. We don't know what's going to happen to productivity in the future, but we kind of know what's going to happen to the labour force because we know about the demographic structures, etc. And if you look at what would have to happen for productivity to increase to in order to maintain the past growth, 
you see that productivity is going to have to transform itself in this region uh, if we're going to maintain the past growth. So it's kind of a message here that there's a tendency to take this, uh, this region and say, if it kept growing at the historical rate, this will be a, a huge economic powerhouse. Well, it could, but it's a different kind of growth model that's going to be needed in the future. And I think this is important to understand because this creates a whole lot of really interesting opportunities for a range of sectors, including the bus industry. Um, so where's this productivity going to come from and what's this new growth model going to look like? Um, well, there's five things I just want to touch on which I think are really important to understand about the region. The first is this increasing connectivity. So I mentioned the point that these 10 economies are now performing real sort of economic and political union. Um, what this isn't going to be is, is the, uh, the European Union, nor is it going to be NAFTA, um, but it is going to be quite significant. So what they're aiming for is not to have a single currency here. There's not going to be single monetary policy or anything like what happens in the European Union, but they are trying to get free for, uh, flow of trade, investment, um, and certain skilled labour. And if you think about the transport industry, this is quite significant. Uh, it has impacts in terms of foreign direct investment restrictions, so how easy you can get access to these markets. It has important implications for how you think about sourcing of products. Um, so things about changing local specifications for the size of buses, etc. In theory, these are areas that are going to be harmonised. Um, so there's a range of quite significant implications across the transport sector. Now, if you look at the progress to date, it's really patchy by, by sector. Um, they've got a target to finish this by end of 2015. Uh, I'll let you in on a, a, a little secret here that that's not going to be achieved by the end of 2015, um, but it has made pretty good progress. Uh, and it varies a lot sector by sector. So if you look at it in just a simple way here, you can think about the sectors in terms of what, how much impact will come from this integration and where are they in the, in the pathway to have make it happen. And you see certain sectors like good sectors, so automotive, textiles, these are reasonably well integrated already. Um, but when you get to logistics and the more transport related sectors, it's still a bit of a mixed bag. So there's been some progress, uh, some foreign investment restrictions have been reduced, particularly in the transport sector, but there's still a lot of non-tariff barriers for things like engine parts and so forth, which make this far from a, a, a free market. Um, but this is important to understand because in theory, if we see full integration of ASEAN, you've got the seventh largest economy on Australia's doorstep. Um, and that creates a, a, a range of different new uh, market opportunities. Now, if you look at Linfox, for example, Linfox has been a great success story. Um, they've been in, in ASEAN for about 25 years. Uh, started off in Thailand, now have operations across most of the ASEAN economies. Uh, and uh, Peter Fox, you know, has talked quite, um, quite openly about the challenges of operating this region uh, and the need to take a long-term approach. But there are some encouraging, some real success examples of Australian companies that have made that leap and operating quite successfully in ASEAN. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is that who dominates different sectors? And this is just a range of different logos in different sectors, but they kind of tell an important story. In most ASEAN markets today, they're either dominated by multinationals or local champions. There's very few regional champions at the moment, but this is starting to shift. Um, and just to give you a sense of this, just over the last year, and this is anecdotal, but I've been to about 15 company off-sites um, and invariably they have a banner in the back which says today, you know, national champion of Thailand, Indonesia, etc. tomorrow ASEAN champion. So there's a lot of these local players that have aspirations to move to a more regional uh, market model. Now, many of them won't make it. Many of them ha don't have the capabilities to make that leap, but this, this playing field is going to change quite significantly. Uh, and I think the implication for Australian companies is if you operate in this region, just understanding how these local players are starting to shift that landscape is going to be really important for your operations. So that's briefly about the, the connectivity bit. The other bit which I think is important to understand is what's happening with cities. Um, and I think there's a really interesting story here. If you look at urbanisation, like urbanisation is one of the biggest growth drivers of economies. And we don't talk enough about it. But historically, from the UK Industrial Revolution, through to what happened in the US, Japan, all of this was underpinned by a movement of people from agricultural areas to urban areas. And it drives growth in two ways. You, you take people from low productivity uh, farming jobs to high productivity uh, urban jobs, and that's helpful. But also that those people in the cities send money back to country areas, and that also helps improve productivity by 
buying new plants, equipment, etc. Um, and the really good news from an up-down standpoint is that urbanisation is still really low. Now, we may get confused here. We're sitting in you know, the urban metropolis of, of Singapore. But if we look across ASEAN, only about a third of people live in cities above 200,000 people. If you compare that to Latin America, it's roughly 65%. Right? So it's a very low starting point still of urbanisation. Uh, but this is really starting to happen at a significant scale. And over the next uh, 15 years, an additional 90 million people will move to cities in ASEAN. It's worth thinking about 90 million people moving to cities, additional 90 million people. Um, and some of the biggest increases we'll see will be in the likes of Indonesia, will be in the likes of um, uh, Thailand, uh, and also significant increases in, in, in the Philippines as well. Now, one of the implications of this is that it will lead to a quite a rapidly growing consuming class. Now, if you look at the number of consumers in these, um, in these countries, these are basically the people who can start to afford discretionary purchases, and obviously important for transport industry. And it starts low. It's basically $7,500 income per year, um, so really low levels. But at this level, you start to see a real hockey stick in demand for different goods and services. And at the moment, there's about 80 million households in this consuming class across Southeast Asia. Over the next 15 years, that's going to double roughly to 163 million. So this is not only a massive urbanisation process that's happening, but also a massive growth in the consuming class. Um, and this is what's getting a whole lot of uh, service oriented companies very interested in trying to get access to these markets as they're just starting to hit this takeoff point. The other interesting aspect though, of this is where it's happening. The fastest growth is not happening anymore in the capital cities. It's not in the Manilas, it's not in the Bangkoks, it's not in the Jakartas. It's actually happening in smaller middleweight cities. And many of these cities are not well known outside the region. And I think this is a really important point to understand. Because if you think about the market landscape, and if you're a newcomer to the region, if you can get access to these kind of middleweight cities, um, that's where the huge growth is going to be. Now, it's obviously a lot more challenging because of, of distribution channels, et cetera, for some of these cities, and you have to get the timing right. But this is a really interesting opportunity of how do you get access beyond the capital cities to these high growth markets. So this is where we're going to do a bit of another quiz question. I assume we don't have anyone who's in the, the diaper-related areas here. I, mean, I think that's a pretty safe bet with the busing industry, but just checking. So the question is this. Which of these cities is going to have the highest demand for baby diapers by 2030? And we'll just do a show of hands again. Bangkok, Cebu, which is in the Philippines, a couple for Cebu, Tangerang, which is in uh, Indonesia, a few there, and Jakarta. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like Jakarta has it. Well, actually, out of those, Tangerang is the highest demand, uh, followed by Cebu. Um, and if you look across a range of categories, if you look at this chart from detergents to facial moisturizers to baby diapers, those cities which are in the blue, these are the smaller cities today, which are going to be big drivers of demand going forward. So the question I often ask companies if they're thinking about operating this region, how do you get access to the likes of Bakasi, Georgetown, Bien Hoa, Koen Khans, these cities that don't have much of a footprint today? Because these are going to be really important to the ASEAN growth story going forward. Uh, the other bit of this is infrastructure. Right? And obviously, um, you don't have to tell you about the importance of infrastructure for your business. Uh, but there's historically been a really significant underspending in infrastructure in the region. Uh, and basically since the financial crisis, uh, infrastructure investment really just dropped um, as, they come, as countries tried to balance the books. And if you look over the next 15 years, um, roughly $7 trillion cumulative of infrastructure is needed. Uh, and Indonesia's got the biggest increase. Um, the projection is that they'll need to increase infrastructure spend six times their historical levels. Um, likewise in Vietnam and Philippines, so massive increases from what we've seen in the past. Now, the question is, is this going to happen? Um, well, there's no certainties in this, but actually the signs are pretty good that we are going to get some serious infrastructure investment. Um, and one is the political will. So if you look at um, President Jokowi from Indonesia, for example, he has made infrastructure one of his um, uh, priorities for his presidency. And indeed, when he was a mayor before that of Jakarta and Solo, it was infrastructure that really got him well known. So he's trying to use the same model to just at a massive scale of Indonesia and how to think about that. Um, the second thing which I think is interesting is a lot of countries, including Malaysia and Indonesia, have unwound resource subsidies, so energy subsidies. And that's given them a bit of fiscal headroom to actually spend money on infrastructure. 
Um, and the third thing is that they're starting to tap a lot more international capital. So many of you would have heard the Chinese have set up the Asia uh, Infrastructure Bank, um, and, and uh, organisations like this are starting to make capital available that wasn't there previously. So there's no certainty in this, but the signs are actually pretty good that we're going to see quite significant trans um, transformation um, in urban infrastructure. Uh, the other thing that's also encouraging is an increasingly focus on sustainability options, and particularly about more innovative transport solutions. Uh, and this is partly reflective in um, the, the fact that mayors in Indonesia have got more power now, um, so they can have more influence over some of these urban transformation options. And also because there's more information out there about what this kind of more efficient models look like to tackle things like congestion, which is a big, big issue. Uh, for any of you that have spent any time in Jakarta, you'll know that this is uh, not an easy place to get around. So that's uh, the second one. The third one I just want to touch on briefly is around technology. And you know, all of you would have heard about the new big technology that's going to shape your industry and others. Um, we um, uh, looked at a range of different technologies, and the thing that stood out in ASEAN was, first of all, this is a technology-loving region. Right? So if you, you look at the numbers, uh, mobile users, third biggest region in the world, Facebook users, second biggest region in the world. Um, Jakarta, in fact, is the Twitter capital of the world. So if you're thinking about operating here with a compelling consumer proposition, that must have a, some kind of social media um, application to it. And indeed, if you look at a lot of the most innovative transport models that are happening in Southeast Asia, from Gojek to others, uh, all of them have a strong social media um, and app-based app focus to them. And so it's worth thinking about how does that uh, how does that influence your particular business if you're operating in this region? Um, the other thing that's interesting is that despite the consumers loving this technology, businesses here are really struggling. So when I was at McKinsey, we did a survey of companies and we said, how important are some of these innovations uh, to your business and is your business model at risk? And 80% of them said our business model is at risk from one of these different technologies. Then we said, well, how satisfied are you that you're actually on top of it? Um, and only about 6% were satisfied. So it's a really striking difference. 80% right? realise that their business models are potentially at risk. 6% um, uh, believe that they're comfortable that they've got a hold of this. Uh, and obviously this is not unique to Southeast Asia, but I think it's playing out particularly here, given the particular tech-loving consumer uh, market and the fact that there's, there's so many opportunities to leapfrog different stages of development with these technologies. Um, so it's worth just thinking about, if, again, if you're thinking about Southeast Asia, how do you ride this kind of technological change that's shifting across these 10 countries? I'll skip this one. Um, the fourth one I want to talk about is the competitive landscape. And the, the, we could talk about lots of different things here, but I just want to talk about one thing, and that's family-owned businesses. Um, and family-owned businesses, and I know many of your companies are indeed family-owned, um, they have a huge role here. In Southeast Asia, Roughly 80 to 90% of businesses that are over a billion dollars in revenue um, are family owned. This is the highest of anywhere in the world. It's just worth remembering, this is a, a region dominated by family owned businesses. And so any strategy, a strategy that you have, whether it's partnerships um, uh, along the value chain, whether it's about market entry, invariably that will come along with some family owned business. And the family owned businesses in Southeast Asia are at quite a unique moment. Uh, they're in a period of succession from where the founder has got to the stage where they have to let go of the business. Uh, and as many of you know, that's a difficult process. Um, and many of these family-owned businesses are struggling with that at the moment. Um, and this is leading to buyouts in some cases. Uh, it's also leading to splits of companies across a range of different areas. Um, and it's quite a significant upheaval that's going on. Um, so my, I'd urge you that if you are thinking about operating in Southeast Asia, come with in mind that the family-owned businesses are going to be crucial to that, and how you deal with them is going to be crucial to your particular success in this industry. So these are all the kind of, I guess, the positives in some way. I, I want to talk a little bit about headwinds, right, because it's not all upside as we know. Um, and I, I talked already about the fact that productivity is going to have to increase, but there are also some other challenges. Um, and one of them is, is China. I'm not sure how well you can see this chart, but basically, um, I know for all of you who are in the press, you know that China is going through this massive transition. And there's lots of aspects to it, but fundamentally China is moving from a model where they were driven by massive investment. Um, and they basically held down wages, held down um, the cost uh, to savers, and they subsidised investment. 
Uh, and this model worked very well um, whilst there were still good investment opportunities. But invariably, when you're investing at the scale that China was, it leads to excesses. And we saw problems of state-owned enterprises, we saw problems of local governments and splurges of investment. And so now China has embarked on shifting this model to something that's more sustainable. So they're moving from more investment driven to more consumption driven. And so you see here that projections for investment growth rates are really gonna start to slow over the coming years. Now, the question is what does this mean for Southeast Asia? Well, different countries will have different influences. Um, in Australia, there'll be you know, some influence. Um, basically, every 1% reduction in China's invest investment ratio knocks about 0.2% of growth off Australia. So if you think about um, the fact that China could lose about 4% um, 4 of investment, that's roughly almost 1% of Australia's GDP growth that could be knocked off. Um, so Australia's gonna have to look for new growth drivers to, to fill that hole. Uh, but Australia's not alone. If you look at Southeast Asia, Thailand is significantly affected, and also Malaysia, which comes as a real surprise, but Malaysia actually has one of the, the strongest dependencies on China when you look at where the trade goes for all the inputs that have the final destination in China. Um, so that is gonna be a significant headwind, particularly in the short term, for these countries to navigate. The China slowdown and how do they fill that growth void? Um, the other aspect is debt. You know, we talk a lot about household debt in Australia, um, but household debt here too is an issue. Um, if you look at, at, it's only in certain pockets, but basically if you look at Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand, these are countries with quite significant consumer debt. And probably most worrisome is in, in Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, the average consumer debt levels in, in those two countries are even above the US. Uh, so there are some real issues which are just starting to, uh, to, to bite. So and what does this mean? Well, obviously this could mean some uh, potential financial issues, although the, the both governments have, uh, have been pretty good on the fiscal sustainability side. But of course, I mean that the consumer market starts to face a few more headwinds. So consumers have to wind back their spending uh, to reduce their debt levels. So that's a bit of a headwind to think about those consumer markets. And then the third aspect is just government regulation. And as all of you know that um, what gets written by a bureaucrat can have huge influence over every aspect of your, um, of your industry. Uh, and this is particularly the case in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and people often complain about the fact that government policy seems to change at a whim in Southeast Asia, uh, which in some cases can be true. But I think it's, almost, it's also instructive just to understand what are the set of issues that are going through policymakers' heads in Southeast Asia. And I've just put a few of these on the board here. But you see that they're dealing with, you know, how do they think about uh, trans transboundary haze issues that we've had from Indonesia. In, in Malaysia, it's about this one MDB, which is this billion dollar government um, failure. Uh, it has quite significant political implications. They're thinking about people migration, particularly in Myanmar. Uh, the South China Sea issues with China. They're thinking about jobless growth. They're worried about competitive threats from the ASEAN economic community. There's a range of these different issues that are playing out at the moment. Um, and, and this is why we often see that government policy, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, can be um, a little incoherent at times. Because you see sometimes policymakers with the best of intentions are trying to balance all these different issues, often with limited bandwidth and capacity. Um, now I think the implication for your companies is obviously you can't influence uh, necessarily at all those levels, but it's worth trying to build your regulatory muscle if you operate in these regions and really understand how you can be helpful in those markets and how you can push along the ball um, for regulators in those areas to make it easier for them to make the right decisions. Often we find that in, in key decisions that get made in Southeast Asia, particularly outside Singapore, they're often made by regulators that don't have a full fact base of what the implications of those are. Um, so private sector organisations and companies that can be helpful in that can really uh, have some quite significant influence. Um, so with that, um, let me just wrap up um, uh, and, and just I guess play back the themes um, I, I do really believe in this, the Southeast Asia opportunity I think could be significant and one that is underlooked. Um, if you look at Australia today, we have double the amount of foreign investment in New Zealand than we do in Southeast Asia. And you consider New Zealand's economy is less than 10% that of Southeast Asia. Right? So we really are batting below our weight when it comes to ASEAN. So there is a real opportunity for Australian companies to be more actively involved here. And I think to operate successfully, it's, it's worth being mindful of these factors. So 
understanding how this ASEAN economic community will impact your business, what opportunities it will create in getting easier access to markets and how that's moving by country. Uh, secondly, how you think about accessing these middleweight cities uh, and these new markets of untapped growth. Um, the third, these different technologies, how do you access that consumer opportunity and build a really, really compelling proposition uh, for consumers in this market? Uh, fourth, how do you deal with family-owned businesses? Um, and what's the way to effectively operate with these as partners in some of these companies, countries? Uh, and finally, you know, the headwinds to growth, many of them will be outside your control, but how do you think about dealing with things like currency volatility, the hedging that comes of that, um, and also dealing with the kind of government regulatory concerns that may arise? Uh, so with that, I hope that gives you a little bit of uh, a flavour of what's happening in Southeast Asia um, and something to ponder when you're, you're on the beach this afternoon. Thank you very much.